Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for the second week of 2018. I'm Carl Estabrook. Since 1990, this program has been a weekly hour of spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on a so-called community radio station and now via Urbana Public Television and YouTube. Our program's name, News from Neptune, comes from Noam Chomsky, who's been writing sensible things about U.S. politics for half a century. Chomsky says that the U.S. media either repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true and it will sound like it's from Neptune. Tonight, David Green and I will try to say some true things with thanks to Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson for research. No's notes are posted on the blog, newsfromneptune.com. We try to bear in mind the murdered Rosa Luxemburg's remark from a century ago, the most revolutionary thing one can do is always to proclaim, proclaim loudly what is happening. This is I'm, an I'm with the band edition of News from Neptune. Our friend Ed Mandel, one of the few Republicans who considers me a friend, I think, writes as follows, quote, there's an interesting video on the Rush Limbaugh site about shadow banning on Twitter. This procedure could be done against any controversial group. Close quote. Shadow banning. I hasten to our resident expert, Dr. No, Mycroft to my Sherlock, and asked. His answer was, what a coincidence. I was just about to include that in my notes. Shadow ban banning is when a centralized message conveyor, say Twitter, allows a user to post normally and make the post appear normally in the user's own feed, but then secretly doesn't distribute copies of the posted message to anyone. Subscribers don't see the posted message, so they're far less likely to link to it, retweet it in Twitter parlance, thus the post is less likely to be read. Apanov Vandrevu, former Twitter, Twitter software engineer, said, quote, one strategy is to, is to shadow ban so that you have ultimate control. The idea of a shadow ban is that you ban someone, but they don't know they've been banned because they keep posting, but no one sees their content. So they just think that no one is engaging with their content, when in reality, no one is seeing it. Shadow banning is getting news coverage now because Project Veritas has just released another series of undercover videos wherein Twitter employees explain that they're taking clever, censorious steps to keep people using Twitter while meeting agreements the site made with the U.S. government to block the bad posts, presumably Russians and anyone who criticizes the American empire and anyone uh, uh, some company pays to censor. Uh, you can find this account on YouTube, if it hasn't been shadow banned, uh, and the clips from Project Veritas, which will be posted on the News from Neptune Facebook timeline. Downranking, what former Google CEO Eric Schmidt said Google would do to RT's entries in their database. RT is the Russian-sponsored uh, television uh, series uh, programs uh, like the BBC, like the BBC, the British Broadcasting Company, is to the British government the way RT is to the Russian government. In fact, in recent times, because of the hysterical propaganda coming out of Washington, I found RT to be far more reliable in giving an accurate account than uh, the BBC or France 2 or certainly any American commercial uh, mainstream media. Downranking shadow bans and other things such as trying to get the fecal, uh, sorry, that's the Latin version of the Anglo-Saxon uh, word, uh, people to show up is a product thing we're working on. Uh, that's a quote from Olinda Hassan, allegedly a policy manor, ma manager at Twitter in their, quote, trust, trust and safety division, censorship. Mahai Floria, allegedly a software engineer at Twitter, said, quote, it's really hard to decide what to do about Donald Trump. Half of the people want to ban him. Half of the people want to keep him. 
What is poor Twitter to do, you know? Are they to ban him half the time and keep him half the time? Uh, you don't remember anything about free speech in the media offhand, do you? No. Remember the Barbie doll from years ago that said math is hard? Free speech is hard. By the way, shadow ban is not to be confused. This is uh, uh, Dr. No talk, giving us his, the range of uh, cultural uh, references that, he's avail that he is uh, aware of and has available to him. He says, by the way, shadow ban is not to be confused with a 1978 and I Andy Gibb disco hit, Shadow Dancing. But some of the lyrics of the song are apropos, even though the song itself refers to a completely different situation. Quote, and in a world of people, there's only you and I. Only you can see me through. I leave it up to you. Close quote. Dr. No concludes with a mantra from News from Neptune. The poets often get there first. You're watching News from Neptune, and I'm with the band edition, and we'll go to David Green. <laughs> well, as I told you, I didn't have much of a response for that other than, you know, I'm not sure where this fits into the, to our understanding of, of what is actually going on, but I guess if it's well, part of what's, if this is a part of what's actually going on, what's actually happening, then we should be even more concerned about what is actually happening that they don't want us to know to know about what's, exactly. what's going on. And uh, as, I, as I promised you uh, a couple days ago when we, we first communicated about the program, I, I'm kind of uh, back into the, into the Israel-Palestine mode this, this week, for, mm -hmm. primarily for the reason that um, Norman Finkelstein is being interviewed uh, most uh, thoroughly on the Real News Network by Aaron, Aaron Maté, a series of four interviews about his book about Gaza, and, and, uh, which is subtitled and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, in Gaza and, and uh, Inquest into its Martyrdom. Uh, and he was also, Finkelstein was also uh, interviewed by Amy Goodman, um, which was kind of an interesting thing. I didn't, I didn't watch it, but I read the transcript. And what was interesting, uh, although of course I give Amy Goodman credit for having allowed uh, Finkelstein, Finkelstein access to her show over, over the years, over the last 15 years or so, including a his notorious interviews or debates with Al Alan Dershowitz, um, which he referred to, I think, uh, in his interviews on the Real News Network. Mm -hmm. But, um, but, but anyway, um, one point of sort of passive con contention during his interview with Amy Goodman had to do with the support that Charles Schumer, the New York senator, lends to to you know Israel and and its cover for its various assaults as well as Schumer's support for Donald Trump's allegedly controversial uh, recent declaration that Jerusalem would be recognized by the United States as Israel's capital um, and I and basically I say passive because Amy Goodman didn't have any response to that um, and what I read into that is Amy Goodman is still wanting to sort of have her black hats and white hats during the, the Trump era. And Charles Schumer um, still pretty much has a white hat because he isn't a member of the, of the Republican Party. Uh, I could be reading too much in, into that, Carl. I don't know if you, if you noticed that or not. But, um, but anyway, um, I was impressed by the thoroughness of probably an hour, hour and a half of uh, Aaron Maté's interviews with Norman Finkelstein, starting out in a rather dispassionate way, but ending up with some rather passionate statements about, by Finkelstein about the failure of the various human rights groups, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, and so forth, to respond uh, appropriately to the truth of what happened in Gaza in, in 2014. Um, which, uh, of course, uh, Finkelstein has always considered not a war but a, a massacre. And um, he went into some detail in, did, in, 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 in you know, describing uh, what the nature of that massacre was. Ironically, he pointed out 
that some of the best, in lieu of the human rights groups, um, thoroughly reporting and uh, providing the facts on the basis with which to condemn Israel, Israel's you know, behavior, Finkelstein pointed to the, to the group Breaking the Silence, the Israeli Soldiers Group, which uh, not necessarily, even according to Finkelstein, not ne necessarily because they even oppose what Israel did, does, but the, because they want to at least be truthful about what 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 Israel does, uh, has provided the the best the best account, the most honest account of how of how ruthless uh, the, the Israel was during Operation Protective Edge in 2014 in uh, devastating Gaza in a in a a fairly a fairly systematic way, which had nothing to do with with ha you know, Hamas. Um, also, very interesting debates during the first parts of these segments about about Hamas and what their moral liability is, about what their uh, about what their options are, about what we have we do or don't have a right to to advise or preach or lecture to God, to Hamas or to Gaza at large about the nature of their violent or nonviolent resistance to Israel's control of that. But um, this is a pretty, uh, there's so many ways that I can, I can go, go with this, but of course in 2014 was along what, what happened subsequent to, to Gaza was of course this Steve, Steven Saleda affair here because his response, his tweets in response to what going, what's going on, which are usually called angry tweets, yes. which they were, but of course Good were reason. also morally outraged <clears throat> tweets. Right, exactly. Uh, uh, and as, as that has played out since then, um, I, I don't know, it, it's, I guess it's hard to, to understand, to get any perspective on whether or not Finkelstein's book will have any effect on public discourse. That is whether it will be, will be reviewed in the, the New York Times, whether it will be talked about, whether, as is usually the case, people will will just will just ignore his his work. Uh, the, the the only the only um, work that wasn't ignored that he's come up with uh, that that in, 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 that was that was clearly had to be responded to was his work in the whole Holocaust industry in 2000, because that just sort of had to be responded to, of course, in a negative way by the, the Jew, Jewish, Jewish establishment and the Israel lobby. I recall what the, the New York Times book review was written by, uh, of that book, The Holocaust Industries, was written by a fellow named Omer Bartov, a oh, historian yes. who teaches at Brown. And uh, you taught at Brown, I didn't did. you? I did. And, uh, and uh, and he came here to 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 speak and uh, uh, and also was re responded to by the late historian Peter Peter Novick from the University of Chicago, right. who also came here not to so much speak about that, but he ended up speaking about it in in a, you know, a, a sort of seminar seminar occasion, which I had a, a chance to respond to this, and it was not a a pleasant situation. Uh, probably for for either of us or, or or anyone there, but I was a little a little more a little more impetuous in those in those days than I am now. Although I'm not sure that I would behave any any differently in that partic particular situation. But um, this is an important book at coming at an at an important time, and it just uh, you know enters into all of the uh, all of the. You know, it provides a, a step back from all of the sort of uh, la lack of perspective that w that we tend to get from uh, from viewing the daily events in Israel and Gaza. And to that, I I shouldn't forget, uh, should not at all forget, of course, as as Finkelstein mentions, uh, he he's what he's calling now for uh, in his in his comments on what you know what is to be done, um, among other things, is for a. For a for a for a slapping intifada, uh, in the in the wake of the of the Palestinian teenage girl, teenage young woman, I'm, perhaps I should say, uh, Ahed Ahed Tamimi, uh, who has been taken off to an Israeli prison or you know detention facility of some some sort, which I think could be fairly called you know a prison, uh, as many Pal as hundreds of Palestinian children are every year. Uh, for having slapped a soldier who was uh, basically trespassing on her home in her 
village of Nabisala, which has been well known for resisting the settler, the settler encroachments and the encro encroachments of the Israeli military itself over the past few years. Uh, Nabisala is a place where regular demonstrations take place against these these facts of life in the occupied uh, West Bank. And meanwhile, our uh, <laughs> If you'll allow me the privilege of free associating here as we move back and, port and forth between Urbana-Champaign and uh, Israel-Palestine, uh, we have our esteemed uh, president uh, running back and forth to, to, to Israel, signing, signing agreements, signing re research accords with their, with their universities there, uh, as if nothing is going on, as if nothing is mm -hmm. happening there, mm -hmm. uh, to evoke uh, Rosa, Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, we should, of course, understand what is happening there in Norman Finkelstein, as usual. Uh, more than anyone else I can think of in, in, in book-length versions is telling us what's, what's going on on there. And uh, people, um, people who know me know that I place them right up, right up at the top of people that I you know, admire and that I feel a certain uh, spiritual, if I could use that word, affinity towards in terms of the manner in which he pro approaches his topic. As you go through these, uh, through these four these four interviews, uh, the it starts off in a fairly calm way, but by the end he's he's um, he's uh, fairly agitated, although in a controlled way, and, and I think in a in an in an you know, appropriate way, and uh, I, I like that he wears his emotions on his sleeve without without disrupting the rational and logically moral message that he that he brings. And it's important, I think, to realize how the discussion about Israel um, is for us an aspect of uh, the U.S. war making in the Middle East and indeed around the world, because the reason the U.S. wants to control Middle East, the Middle East, is to control the oil business and the uh, flow of oil, particularly to China. Um, so it's part of the worldwide uh, uh, foreign policy planning of the United States uh, that we as American citizens are responsible for. Uh, it's talked about in very peculiar ways in this country, uh, and uh, all sides, I think, probably contribute to that, uh, particularly those people who see themselves on the left and condemn Israel's direction of American policy, uh, what we've called the higher anti-Semitism. It's all the Jews' fault, uh, the Jews in Israel who uh, tell the U.S. what to do in making wars. This is nonsense, uh, and spite of the undoubted influence of an Israel lobby in this country. There are many other lobbies that are at least as important, and in most cases far more important, including the arms lobby. But the uh, fact of the matter is that the uh, uh, misinterpretation of the U.S. relationship to Israel um, is, a, is the source of a lot of uh, uh, bad thought in the American public about what uh, uh, the American war in the Middle East, uh, American wars in the Middle East are all about. Uh, so understanding what Israel is and what Israel is doing is worthwhile not just for understanding what uh, uh, crimes that are being uh, perpetrated by the state of Israel, but how the U.S. is responsible for them, how the U.S. support for Israel, um, which depends primarily on the fact that Israel is a stationary aircraft carrier in the Middle East for the United States, uh, U.S. support for Israel makes these crimes possible. U.S. could not, could, uh, I mean, Israel could not conduct the apartheid uh, uh, regime uh, in the occupied territories, a regime that many say is far worse than the apartheid regime in South Africa of a generation ago, uh, Israel would not be able to do that without American support, economic, military, uh, diplomatic, and political, uh, and Americans should be aware of what we're supporting. Uh, that's the sort of thing that Stephen Salata was trying to talk about uh, mm -hmm. as a member, uh, <laughs> as briefly a member of the faculty of Little University down the street. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's that sort of discussion that should be going on and is programmatically removed. Um, 
We do hear some strange things in Israel these days. Uh, in the last week, in relationship to the Tamimi case you talked about, mm -hmm. uh, there was at least one member of the Knesset who said, essentially, uh, sh the uh, her her uh, prisoner, her prison guards. She's imprisoned in Israel for slapping a soldier. Uh, her prison guard should take her out and rape her. Uh, I mean, just, just he, did, he didn't say the word rape. He did not but, use the but word he rape. Implied, but you know, anybody reading that would imply that. The implication is clear. Yes. The agriculture minister in uh, Israel uh, said uh, two days later, "We've got to start killing more Palestinians." Mm -hmm. I mean, the, these folks have yeah. gone nuts. Yeah, this and is that's craziness. exactly what Finkelstein said. He's yeah. he's he's long consigned. He he what he did say, what he sort of you know sort of you know interestingly said during during these interviews was that was that there used to be a kind of a left or a kind of a, at least in, there used to be a part of Israeli Israeli society that supported those journalists that that we're familiar with that are that are genuinely dissident the, the main two of which are I'm not sure maybe they're they're the only ones Gideon Levy and 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 you know, Amira Amira Haas and basically said now uh, there, there really isn't an aspect of Israeli society even though those two individuals continue to to write in you know in Haaretz the 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 liberal sort of the Israeli New York Times um, they really don't have any support. There isn't any body, any political party, any element, any faction. He may, may be exaggerating that in a certain way yep. because I think people like Jeff Halper, people like the these, you know, there there still are soldiers groups refuse nicks, and I think some, if if not most, of the people in the breaking uh, the breaking the silence are motivated by a genuine uh, opposition to what to what's going on in the the, the you know the uh, the the you know the occupation. We read the columns of Uri, 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 Uri Avneri in in Counterpunch, who has been been a dissident for the last 70 years, ever since he was a young man. <laughs> right. He was a non-dissident. He fought in the Israeli War of, of you know, Independence as a very young man in 1948. But all that aside, Finkelstein stressed the fact that there really isn't Israel, Israeli political spectrum has moved so far to the right that uh, there really isn't anything that could be called a genuinely dissident party. And you see that symptomatic of the manner, I mean, in, in terms of Americans trying to hold up someone like, a, like a, you know, Ehud, Ehud you know, Barak as, a, you know, a representative of the peace camp uh, in the tradition of, of Yitzhak of Yitzhak Rabin, um, it just it works less and less. And I was actually going to going to ask you before we go on here: Did any Democrats in the Congress actually oppose Trump's declaration of you know, Jerusalem being being recognized? Because I know Chuck mm -hmm. Schumer didn't. Mm -hmm. And and the point that Finkelstein made was that when the Israel lobby does assert its power, is when it doesn't really matter. So this is what Finkelstein consigns the whole, the whole Jerusalem issue to, is that, well, this is an issue that doesn't really matter. Therefore, Sheldon Adelson uh, wants Donald Trump to do this. Donald Trump does it. There isn't much, there isn't right. any, any, any opposition from any of, any of the uh, other factions in the broad array of foreign policy advocates that doesn't really that that really opposes this so it goes forward and you know people oppose it in the, the new york times and say oh terrible that this means that there's a real end to the possibility of two states blah 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 but in in reality there was no more or less possibility of two states the day before this was done than the day after it was done. That's a very good point and very much worth st uh, stressing. Uh, what the uh, Obama administration did um, was, uh, once in its characteristic fashion, take the issue of American support for Israel and for Israeli apartheid um, and put it on the back burner, uh, managed to downplay it and so forth. And paradoxically, in a way, uh, Trump's insistence on moving the embassy to Jerusalem has 
brought it back up again. Uh, the people are talking about Israel and Palestine, often badly. The information that they get from mainstream media in this country is very bad, but at least it's being talked about, whereas uh, no drama Obama, as he was called, had had suppressed. I had, I had not heard that. Had suppressed. <laughs> you not heard that? that? Never uh, heard that. <laughs> but the point was to suppress it. I mean, uh, the... Uh, uh, the the characteristic of uh, political discussion in the Obama years was uh, uh, acquiescence uh, and somnolence. Go back to sleep. Everything is okay. The yeah. usual people are running things. We're running in the usual yeah. way. Oh yes, indeed, we yeah. are provoking the Russians on the in the in the east and the Chinese uh, in the west and the Chinese in the east. But uh, that's just the normal provocation of Eurasia that all American uh, 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 administrations do. Pay no attention, et cetera, et cetera. And the peculiarities of Trump and the reason he is so deeply hated by the American political establishment is that he raised these questions again in the campaign, awkwardly, stupidly, often in an unclear fashion, but he did do it and people heard it, including people who's in important counties in the Midwest, uh, which didn't vote for Clinton because uh, their kids were. Uh, involved in the military in the Middle East, and they knew that that was going on, and that made a difference. So uh, in some sense, the Trump <coughs> administration has raised these questions again and attracted the undying hatred of the American political establishment. The American political establishment doesn't want to drive Trump from office, and maybe even from this life, um, uh, because he's doing things that are clearly opposed to the neoliberal and neoconservative policies of the Obama administration, but he might. Uh, he threatened to. He looks like he could. And God knows he's so erratic that he might stumble into uh, peace talks with uh, uh, the president of China and the president of Russia, and we can't have that. And it's this attitude on the part of the American political establishment that is productive of the Trump derangement syndrome that we find on the left as well. Uh, you and I were talking about uh, an article in uh, the Counterpunch uh, this morning by Andrew Levine. Uh, this seems to me to be suffering from that. Uh, I think the best thing the, uh, the left could do is uh, get its act together in terms of giving an account of what the American political establishment is actually up to and pay a little less attention to the vagaries of Donald Trump. Well, our friend Jeff Lee St. Clair seems to have, have capitulated pretty much as well, or am, am I wrong? No, I'm afraid there's a touch of that with, with Jeff. Jeffrey St. So, Clair, the editor of Counterpunch yeah. and a friend of this crown, is not a fan of Donald Trump. Uh, and I'm not suggesting one should be a fan yeah. of Donald Trump, yes. but I think he is uh, uh, perhaps... Um, I, have to be uh, careful not to, I have to be careful not to do this, because people are going to think that I'm symbolically supporting Donald Trump, because he always does this, you know, so I better keep doing this. Anyway. Uh, the hand <laughs> gestures are interesting. I mean, as, as yeah. theater, as theater, you have to admit that Trump uh, uh, produces some uh, boffo moments. <laughs> what, what I wanted to mention, I actually got around to writing the article this week that I, I that I had set myself to write a few weeks ago uh -huh. after a panel that Amy Goodman had hosted about anti-Semitism blah, 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 in New York, not, not in anti-Semitism in New York, but the panel was, was, right. in, was, in, was in New York, and I kind of procrastinated about that and felt that the timing wasn't very good over Christmas and New Year's. And then with all the discuss, discussion about, about the, the U, US, U.S. Embassy and so forth, um, and with the, you know, Tamimi, but, but still I got around to writing it this week and submitted it to Counterpunch. It's, it's not up yet. Oh, good. I don't know whether they're going to like it. I don't know, I don't know whether they're going to put it up. But basically what I, what I concluded that article by saying was that, that what's going on in Israel-Palestine, you know, as a, as a way of organizing, as a way of organizing Jewish people, Jew, Jewish American people who supposedly say that they want a, that they want two states, but never get off their butts to actually do anything to support a two-state solution actually happening. When in fact, 
mainstream liberal Jews, sort of Jews that are affiliated with the reform, the reform religious movement and the, the Hillels and the, the, the federations and so on and so forth, and people like me who are not affiliated with those things but are, you know, liberal to left, um, that we, we should assert our voice if we really mean that, and that the Trump, the Trump presidency presents an opportunity that the Obama presidency did not because people were so passive, they were so defensive about, right. just, about just protecting Obama against all this criticism and assuming he was going to do, do something. But now it's clear that Trump has basically challenged us to say, well, if you want two states, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to organize in this country vis-a-vis -vis our own politicians and our own government, which, as you rightly say, could make this happen because anything that's happening in Israel is only with the sufferance of American foreign policy. I think that that's the important point for for us as Americans when we look at this situation. I might say that the interview with Norman Finkelstein that David's been talking about is being featured on our companion program, Aware on the Air, that uh, uh, airs here on Tuesday uh, on Tuesday night, uh, and is available also on YouTube. Uh, all four parts of the interview with uh, Norman Finkelstein that the Real News Network do, has done uh, are available on the Real News Network and also will be shown here and available as part of uh, Aware on the Air. Aaron, um, Aaron, Aaron Maté, the guy who, who interviewed this week, must not be sleeping much because in the midst <laughs> of doing all that, he also maintains his nose firmly into the, the whole Russiagate dossier business at a very detailed level, which I don't quite, <laughs> mm -hmm. I can't quite get into myself, but he did a, a very complicated interview with Marcy Wheeler uh, in yeah. the last couple of days that, again, it was hard to follow. I almost yeah. shut it off, but I... I kind of hung in there because um, I kind of want to figure out, I want to get to what the punchline is, but there never is a punchline. Well, <laughs> it's strange. Uh, I have not watched this interview, but Marcy Wheeler, I've known, known for a while. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know quite where she's been recently, so to speak. Um, uh, in part because she does seem to have been captivated by the uh, uh, Russiagate nonsense, uh, and um, uh, so perhaps I should listen to this interview and find out. But she, in, in the old days, uh, she was pretty good at exposing uh, uh, governmental uh, U U.S. governmental yeah. nonfeasance, yeah. and uh, uh, certainly worth talking yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, the Russiagate thing is worth talking about, not because it tells us much about Russia uh, or much about American elections, but because it tells us a great deal about uh, the American political establishment and the uh, frenzy that it finds itself in, uh, that, uh, hey, look, this is where I came in. I grew up with the McCarthyist business, uh, my family involved in various ways, and um, uh, to see it again. We don't have to go into that, do we? <laughs> Well, to see it, to see it. Well, hey, look, I was young, yeah. but uh, to see it again is not um, uh, is astonishing. If you had yeah. told me even a year ago that the RussiaGate stuff would be taken seriously all over, uh, uh, the uh, I, I would not have believed it. Now that said, there are peculiar chinks in the armor. Uh, there, uh, the. Uh, uh, the, the cracks in the facade are usually what let the light through, and uh, one of the uh, no, most notable what occurred this week in a piece in the New Yorker, where Masha Gessen, of all people, wrote a serious account of uh, the uh, Fire and Fury book, uh, this book that supposedly exposes uh, the Trump administration by uh, a gossip columnist. Uh, we, and should, we should say who Masha Gessen is for well, the... Uh, uh, Perhaps she's she's not the most prominent figure, but for those who don't read the, the New York Times. <laughs> but the Im important thing is that she's an unlikely person to yes. write a serious account of because this fire and fury book. she has been very much advocating for Russia's involvement and demonizing Russia, a, Russian, a person of Russian background. A Russian-American who has, yeah. uh, uh, yes, as you say, made a reputation for uh, trashing Vladimir Putin. Yeah. Uh, and uh, not that that argument 
could not take place. Right. But it it's a uh, it's not a disinterested argument uh, in the American political establishment. The P Putin derangement syndrome, in its way, is as bad as the Trump derangement syndrome, mm -hmm. and in fact, they're related. Um, you're watching News from Neptune on I'm With the Band uh, uh, edition. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted to turn, uh, David, to something that, uh, you know, to maybe follow this out um, uh, with reference to a, um, uh, an article in the News Gazette this week uh, that I must admit, and for all my years of reading the News Gazette uh, <laughs> and so forth, this one stopped but me. But we say that about something almost every week. <laughs> well, almost there is every that. week we say something I wouldn't have believed, blah, blah, blah. The interesting <laughs> thing is that this one has nothing to do with the News Gazette itself yeah, no, directly no. except the headline. Yeah. Uh, they, what they did was reprint uh, an Associated Press article I even truncated it a bit, uh, on uh, Thursday, uh, an Associated Press article that uh, encapsulates this Russiagate nonsense uh, as if it were a matter of absolute fact. Um, the political position, the fant fantasized political position of the American political establishment is on display there in what is purportedly a news uh, 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 or article from the leading wire service, the Associated Press. Now, the News Gazette just prints it straight. Uh, they put it on page three, what you see when you open up the paper above the fold, and they do write a headline for it. Um, and the headline <laughs> captures the Russiagate nonsense. The headline that the News Gazette provided was Report Russia Interfering Globally and U.S. ignoring it. <laughs> now, now, I mean, that's, that's as good as CNN. I yeah. mean, you, you know, or, or Rachel yeah. Maddow. I yeah. mean, you know, yeah. it's clearly what, clearly what school they've, tra they've trained in. But the fact that it is the same as CNN and Rachel Maddow and so forth suggests that for Americans at large getting their news from the regular sources, there's nothing, there's nothing else to get. Um, uh, as Noam Chomsky said memorably many years ago, not, Americans, it's, Americans not only don't know what's going on, they don't know that they don't know. And uh, this seems to me to be one of the good reasons for it that the uh, News Gazette publishes without comment this AP article. Uh, what the article does is report on a, uh, a, a document released uh, by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee by the Democrats, you know, that good liberal party, remember, the, the, the ben, progressive party? Ben Cardin, uh, Maryland Senator. Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland uh, is the vice chairman, that is the Democratic Party uh, uh, head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he released the report. Uh, it's not a report of the full committee, but uh, it's released obviously with the acquiescence of the Republican chairman of the committee because, hey, that's what the Democrats wanted to do. Uh, what got me was not so much the things that were being said, it's what we've been hearing all along, but the fact that they were said with this um, air of, uh, 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 of obviousness with a clear indication that this is the truth and there's nothing else to be said on the matter that the News Gazette had bought into. The first paragraph of the article is, a new report by Senate Democrats warns of deepening Russian interference throughout Europe and concludes that even as some Western democracies have responded with aggressive countermeasures, President Donald Trump has offered no strategic plan to bolster their efforts or safeguard the U.S. from again falling victim to Kremlin meddling. Now think about that. Trump, is, Trump has not offered a plan to prevent, to safeguard, to safeguard the U.S. from again falling victim to Kremlin meddling. That's the assumption is that Kremlin meddling 
has been demonstrated in regard to the American election, uh, which is certainly not true, uh, but uh, the uh, president, who is probably a Russian agent after all, has uh, done nothing to safeguard the U.S. from again falling victim to Kremlin meddling. We'll next hear about how Senator Cardin's vital body fluids are being affected by this Russian aggression, and uh, the government isn't doing anything to protect him. I mean, people who, uh, uh, who uh, uh, see parallels to the ancient movie, Dr. Strangelove, uh, you know, are not wrong. And another example of the mantra that we repeat here frequently in News from Neptune, the poets, in this case, in this case filmmakers, the poets often get there first. It's just astonishing that this is what's going on, and this is the sort of thing that's being printed as fact in the, uh, uh, in the local press. The report commissioned by the top Democrat of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is the first from Congress to comprehensively detail, they don't mind splitting infinitives, to comprehensively detail Russian efforts to undermine democracies since the 2016 presidential election. Hey, look, the Russians are doing it all the time. You know, we've got to stop it. See vital bodily fluids above. Uh, so look. When this is the sort of thing that we're getting from the standard media across the board, including the News Gazette, how can we expect people to understand any criticism of U.S. war provocations against Russia and China? Uh, it's necessary to make it clear that people not only don't know what's going on, they don't know that they don't know. That's why we're here, right, David? Yeah, I mean, to pay maybe a little bit of a backhand and compliment to the News, News Gazette, I mean, they did publish this AP story with this ridiculous title, mm -hmm. but they're probably less inclined in their general editorial policy, and including the columnists that they publish, the mostly Washington Post columnists which, which they publish, they're probably less inclined to buy into some because of their republicanism and their, their basic sort of um, passive loyalty to, to Donald Trump, not really active loyalty, but passive loyalty to Donald Trump. They're, they haven't really foregrounded necessarily the whole Russiagate business, or, or have I missed something? No, I think you're just trying to be too nice to our friends at the News Gazette. Well, no, which is no, good I mean, and noble of you. I would it's never do that. I would no, <laughs> I, think, I think you may be. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah. look, look, we do have friends at the News Gazette, and we argue with them, and that uh, would seem to me friends, to be the sort of thing friends. that should be good. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I, I'll, go, I'll go that far. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, that should—that is what media should be doing. Yeah. Is what's shocking is when they don't. Um, listen, listen to this. Uh, uh, David pointed out that the report, uh, the Democratic chair of this committee, the vice chair of this committee, uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, has been Senator Cardin of uh, of Maryland. Cardin said the roughly 200-page report is built on both Republican and Democratic ideas. And he commissioned it to show Americans the scope of efforts by Russian President Vladimir Putin to undermine democracy. The scope of efforts by Russia. Now, that's not, <laughs> notice, notice how the article, the AP article puts it. It doesn't say, Cardin says that Russian President Vladimir Putin is trying to undermine g g democracy. No, the report is there to show the scope of efforts by Russian President Vladimir Putin to undermine democracy, it's a foregone conclusion. Yes. So, I mean, there are plenty of villains here to get annoyed with. Uh, yeah, right. The fact that uh, some friends of ours fall in with, to, 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 to this nonsense yeah. should be exposed and perhaps yeah. not excoriated. Well, speaking of our friends, um, <laughs> you know, as you made a comment, I think, in that, in that discourse there about <laughs> Louis, Louis Proyek's ah, re yes. review of a, of a movie that claims in a different vein that uh, Robert Mercer, Cambridge's, you know, okay, okay, it, Robert Mercer, Trump's Svengali, or whatever you want his to call Macinus, it. His Macinus, practically. Uh, Pardon? His Macinus. His, 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 his financial backer. Financial backer. Right. Um, uh, really, really won the election, not because of Russia's meddling, but because of some analytical process by which they targeted the right voters or whatever. But... My general question to that always is, how do you know why voters do what they do? Uh -huh. And it seems like there's, there's two ways, two general ways to, to approach this. One, they might have been influenced directly by something they read or some, mm -hmm. something they did or something Russia allegedly did. And the other thing is that they're, 
they're influenced by general by their world, by the things that the the way that they feel every day about the way the political system is actually working in a much more general way, but then it somehow ends up channeling itself into thinking, well, do I like the people in power or do I not like the people in power? Am I going to vote to keep those people in power or am I going to put some other people in power? And one can argue for both of those things. That's not to argue for the Russia for the Russian influence, but there could be other, you know, it could be a good political ad that, that convinces somebody to vote for somebody, and it could be the fact that their life really sucks, but, or, or even that the, their life is okay, but they see that the life of other people around them sucks. But ultimately, everybody assumes that they can understand why people voted what, what they do, but I think the argument that we've tried to make on this program is that the, the the safest thing to do is to look at those <laughs> at those them. at those counties yeah to look yeah, at those right. counties and those states which were more more important that allowed Trump to win in spite of the fact that he he didn't get more votes to look at those counties and say either they're 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 you know economically distressed counties or as you as point out many times they're counties which send people off to war and that th or that uh, counties with high levels of op opiate opiate related opioid related there deaths you know those things those things you know interest me although they don't prove anything but the russia gate stuff of course doesn't is just is just distraction from looking at at even that and ultimately it's the economic situation in this country that got trump elected president and, and even most of true. the writers on counterpunch don't seem to 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 want to wanna admit that. This is a crucial point. Uh, we must say we're talking about today about various friends of ours, including Louis Proyek, uh, who, uh, corresponding friend of David's, uh, <laughs> who writes the blog The Unrepentant Marxist and is nobody's fool, but is sometimes at least a bit irascible uh, and is worth reading even when he's uh, notably wrong, yeah. as he frequently is. Yeah. We're also talking about our research director, uh, uh, Dr. No, uh, J.B. Nicholson, uh, who has a point on, who has a comment on Louis Proyek's article that uh, uh, David just referred to. Uh, the article, by the way, which appears, hey, it's all in the family, on the Counterpunch site, uh, edited by another friend of ours, is entitled, How the System Got Trumped, Cambridge Analytica's Electoral PSYOPs Campaign. Uh, you know, uh, Louis learned some new words here, you know, it's not straight out of the uh, socialist worker uh, vocabulary. Uh, d uh, d Dr. No says, and I think quite right, Rightly, I think this runs the risk of disregarding that the poor know their own economic state and they know it's not good. Granted, I've not seen the movie Trumping Democracy, which is what the current Punish article is about, but this review from Louis Proyak makes me hesitant to spend my time watching it. Proyak wrote, quote, Despite the tsunami of reports about Russia meddling with the 2016 elections, this gripping documentary makes the case that it was instead the result of a combination of Robert Mercer's funding and the computer-based psyops his Cambridge Analytica firm exploited. Close quote. You had no idea you were being manipulated uh, in this fashion, uh, either by Russians or by uh, uh, Mercer's. Uh, this, this, this is amazing. Uh, 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 it seems to me David's point is quite right. If you want to know why people voted a certain way, ask them. Uh, <coughs> Dr. No continues, Russian meddling allegations need to be backed up with evidence or denounced as non-existent. It's way too late to bring them up uncritically like this or not mention how they're a cover for, one, pro-war ambitions of the permanent government. Uh, the deep state, as it's called, to Hillary Clinton's second presidential loss and the elitist mainstream media that gave her an overwhelming prediction of being POTUS in 2017, a conclusion they likely reach without talking to any poor people in 2060. <laughs> <laughs> Any claim that a super clever ad campaign somehow steered the 2016 U.S. election to Trump, uh, be it Russian-funded or Analytica-funded, 
needs to be backed with evidence. Simple uh, uh, intelligence from our director of research. PROYAC doesn't summarize any such evidence, likely, likely because no such evidence is given in the movie. In fact, PROYAC claims, quote, it is obviously impossible to prove that the ads made the difference in swinging these states to Trump's advantage, close quote. But this poses a problem for Proyek's essay. If that is not possible, why spend so many words on talking about this? <clears throat> Instead of believing the story of how one group, say, nameless Russians, or another's, Mercer's PSYOPs group, masterminded Trump's electoral college victory, how about believing that poor people knew they were not going to be well served by Clinton's neoliberal and neoconservative politics? We have good reason to believe this when we consider some big issues. One, war. Clinton's love of regime change wars around the world, including the secret drone war. Clinton's secrecy about what she told her bankster friends, including her Syrian no-fly zone, which would kill a lot of Syrians, according to The Intercept. Poor people know that the poor, the poor young fight these wars, not the wealthy young. The study referred to in, once again, The Intercept, um, uh, is far more instructive than angry liberals give it credit for being. This was the study in The Intercept that shows uh, the, uh, the relationship between high military casualties and votes for Trump over Clinton. Next, trade. Clinton claimed this TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, sets the gold standard in trade agreements to open free, transparent, fair trade, the kind of environment that has the rule of law at a level playing field, close quote. That was the Clinton uh, propaganda. In fact, the TPP was an anti-Chinese measure uh, that uh, the rest of the world recognized for what it was. Poor people knew they'd been shafted by NAFTA, and there was widespread public hatred for the TPP. There's a recognition of what these trade pacts are and whose interests they are in. NAFTA will shaft you. Uh, uh, <laughs> don't get cute, David. <laughs> the mainstream media knew not to cover the TPP because the only people who would benefit from the TPP were the... <laughs> You see what you've done to me. I know. Sorry. But the only people Sorry. who would benefit were the one percenters whose interests the mainstream media serve. Finally, health care. When Clinton took HMO campaign funding, everyone understood the HMOs were buying both delaying, ideally killing, Medicare for all, and keeping the HMOs in charge of whatever health care plan the U.S. would offer, be it Obamacare, originally Romney Care, or some other lucrative complexity. Louis Proyek said, quote, the real question is not whether the ads made the difference, it is instead what kind of society we're living in, close quote. You're reaching, Louis. Come on, babes. <laughs> See if you can get it together here. Uh, after telling us how the PSYOPs people uh, 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 stole the election uh, instead of the Russians, uh, you know it's not true. <laughs> <clears throat> he says, Dr. No says, it's not a matter, it's not along the lines of looking for a quick answer of who's the man behind the curtain, Putin and the Russian hackers, or Robert Mercer and his Cambridge Analytica PSYOPs firm. People understand what class they're in. Poor people know they're lucky if they're one paycheck away from destitu destitution and what is likely to take that meager income away from them. I think that's exactly right, and in this on this late date, we should recognize that that's so, and that, that you don't have to be as uh, insightful and well-informed as our director of research to know it, but it helps. Well, thank you for that, and just let me add, I think one thing that does need to be added in a, in, in a serious way is to understand who it is who votes, who doesn't vote, who's allowed to vote. Those are important issues. There are there are you know, shenanigans involved in vo voter registration. There is voter voter you know, suppression. Um, whether that determined it, I mean, in, in in a general sense, our elections are determined as much by the fact that so few pe so few people vote, as as to how they vote. But still, the question is, we could talk about poor people all, all we want. Poor people generally, I don't know the exact data on this, but obviously, poor people vote less. Than wealthier people, the higher you go up the income and wealth ladder, the the more often the the higher percentage of of those people vote. But even in in that context, 
some middling group of people in these particular places who had voted for, for you know, Obama in 28 and 2012 voted for either did not vote or voted for Trump and swung those counties and those states in, tw tw in you know in 20, 2016. Yes, we need to be talking about about voting. Uh, Greg Palace does some work on this. I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of Greg Palace because I don't think it's yep. the, I don't think it's the most central issue, but it is an important issue and a real issue. I want to I want to make it clear that 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 is important, regardless of how we talk about who voted for Clinton and who voted for Trump. It's worthwhile asking, <clears throat> as we have in various ways for a long time, uh, why so few people vote? Uh, why so few people vote, he said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, the, the answer is that they understand correctly it doesn't make any difference. Uh, now, this is... <laughs> Uh, this is important on all sorts of levels, it seems to me. There is the uh, study that was put together by uh, two uh, uh, Princeton, uh, actually one Princeton, one, North one Northwestern, Northwestern one, yeah. uh, uh, academics, a political science study, one of the few political science studies I've ever heard that actually made sense and probably found out something, um, that uh, showed that the effect of political opinions and voting uh, was directly proportional uh, to one's wealth. Uh, that for the majority of the electorate, electorate uh, the, those less than the 1%, it really didn't make any difference what they thought. Uh, their voting uh, did not matter and did not change the uh, activities uh, of the uh, uh, relevant governmental uh, operations. Givens and, and why can't I page. think of his name? Page. Ben, Good. Ben, Givens ben and Page. page. Uh, and and it's the, the, the editorial in the News Gazette this morning is a kind of a con con concrete example of that when they talk about how great it is that employees of some of these corporations that got this enormous tax break are getting a thousand bucks or whatever thrown at them. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah, they're getting what they want. As long as the corporations and the wealth holders got what they want, they, they, they get a few crumbs. And that's what they get. They get what, what they want as long as it doesn't conflict with the the big guys exactly. getting, getting what they want. And I was delighted to see, uh, that's a terrible way to put it because oh, no. of the of the real, of the real uh, yeah. I was delighted to see reported the yeah. real horrors of this particular story. The yeah. horrors are that Walmart, uh, largest employer perhaps, it'd be after the Pentagon in the country, yeah. uh, Walmart was giving all these bonuses and closing 60 stores oh, I did not across the country, oh, okay. laying off thousands of people. Oh my God. Uh, and and, uh, uh, and, and keeping their leaner, meaner workforce uh, with a pittance, by all accounts, uh, from this. I mean, we should you, end up the show with what we end up almost every show saying universal basic income. So we should probably end up the show saying well, that with, in that light as well. But even the even the good news is bad here yeah, right. if you're paying attention to it. Yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, I did not notice that. Thank yeah, you for pointing that out. It's uh, quite remarkable. You've been watching news from Neptune for the second week of 2018, presented by Carl Estabrook and David Green, produced and directed by Jason Liggett and Ethan Young. This has been an I'm with the band edition, with thanks to the shadow band Ed Mandel and the shadowy Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson. Inshallah, we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune to remind you, in the words of Edward DeVere, what's past is prologue. What to come in yours and my discharge. You got a final note you want to go out on? No, stay warm. <laughs> in the meantime, confusion to our enemies and a good night to you. <laughs>